The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Souter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Every state except Vermont imposes some form of a balanced budget rule on their state governments, and most states also restrict borrowing by local governments as well. And yet the total amount of borrowing by state and local governments has increased dramatically over the past 40 years or so in the United States. The reason may be due to which, the way in which governments borrow, and a type of bond you might well have never heard of, something called the least revenue bond. What are these bonds, and what are special purpose government agencies, and why does any of this matter to you or I? Joining, my, joining me on eConversations today to help explain these topics and to get to the story behind them is the Executive Director of the Johnson Center, Dr. Steve Miller. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Thanks, Dan. So this is a topic, there's a question of whole the lease revenue bonds is something they, they, I think uh, first came up amongst uh, us here at the Johnson Center with uh, regard to Alabama's proposal to build some new uh, state prisons that, that was put forward next, uh, I think last year for the first time, right? That's correct, uh, about a year and a half ago now. Uh, and the financing at the time wasn't clear. I think that had been sorted out mm -hmm. a little bit later. But the idea was to use a, a debt instrument that most people aren't familiar with called lease revenue bonds to build new prison facilities. And so these are, these are state bonds was the idea. And so they do, they do already exist, they're already well established, so it's not anything new that was being innovated here, just something that came to our sort of like attention maybe for a lot of people in the state for the first time with, with, this, with this issue, right? Right, and they tend to be more common on the local level than mm -hmm. at the state level. Uh, at the state level, it's something that has really only been used on a large scale in a few other states like Florida and New Jersey. Okay, so to get started here, trying to because we have a little bit of ground to go go through, I think to even sort of make sense of what these uh, right. bonds are, what roles they're f serving. Now, I mentioned that states have balanced budget amendments uh, in place, and so if Alabama has to pass a balanced budget every year, it might be a curiosity or might raise a question for some people listening to that is like, well, how is it that the state would be borrowing at all? Because if they have to pass a balanced budget amendment, then they don't, they don't get to do what, like, say, the federal government does, which is just borrow to cover their spending. So you, some people might be confused or be thinking that if, a, if you have a provision against being able to, to borrow to balance the budget, does that mean you can't be borrowing at all? Oh, no, it means you can definitely borrow or the state can borrow the same way that you or I would borrow to purchase a home and that we would be making mortgage payments it's the same goes for governments in terms of making their bond payments whether it's state or local so I mean they're it's part of their budget so long as okay. so their budget is still balanced so long as the revenue they bring in matches the expenditures they make part of the expenditures is the payment they make on bonds that have already been issued just like part of balancing our whole home budget is making our car payment or our house payment Okay, so that, that maybe could clear up a, a first point of confusion that people might have. And then another thing right here is that if, if, we're, if states pass these balanced budget amendments and then people also point to the federal government with our $19 trillion uh, debt and debt being out of control at the federal government level as well, people might be thinking, well, is it just a bad idea for government to be borrowing ever under any circumstances? Well. It could make a lot of sense, actually, for, for the federal government or state governments to, to borrow money. The, again, the same analogy is it might make a lot of sense to use a mortgage to purchase a home. Mm -hmm. Rather than renting for 20 or 30 years until you can afford the cash payment for a home, why not you know, live in the home and not pay twice, in, in essence? Make the mortgage mm -hmm. payment and live in the home. So that's, that's the basic idea, is that if the interest rate is low, and it's a significant purchase and it makes sense to finance it, then yeah, so long as it's a legitimate use of government funds and it, you know, a, a kind of a long-term capital project, something that's going to last a while, it can make a lot of sense to finance it. So if we were going to be using bridges or schools for 20, 30, 40 years or so, you just spread the payments over the whole course of the period of time which people are going to be using these, right? Right, arguably. And what we're probably going to be talking about quite a bit is 
the question really becomes what kind of bond and how it's issued. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> okay, so it could make sense that we have uh, some purposes for which we want to have governments borrow, but there certainly does, in, 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 when we look at the federal government, uh, people have made the argument that the federal government is uh, too much in debt. And, but that statement in and of itself, I think, requires a little bit of unpacking because th there's an issue that arises here that uh, how is it that you could say that the public sector would be too much in debt? And is it just a problem of you know, somebody like me as a fiscal conservative looking at how much government borrowing saying like, well, I think they're borrowing too much? Or, or, or is there some other way we can actually make sense of this uh, idea that governments could be borrowing too much? Yeah, there's probably a couple of ways to look at it. One way to look at it would be, is the borrowing being used to provide legitimate public goods, mm -hmm. right? Or is the borrowing simply being used to uh, enable crony government projects to, to, to continue to be perpetuated? But uh, another important way to look at it is, what do voters, what do citizens want, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, what would the typical voter or a median voter actually want to see in terms of a total level of government debt. And if it's significantly more than that, then that seems like it's probably, just based on voter or citizen preferences, that's going to be an inefficient level of debt if it's much more than what voters would willingly approve. Well, in this, uh, the, the picture I have here is a gentleman, James Buchanan. We, we, those of us at the Johnson Center certainly know all, all very well of Professor Buchanan's work. He won the Nobel Prize in economics, and he really did reshape really changed the way people, uh, economists, thought about issues like the public debt and, and how governments make decisions and, and the, the, this whole issue of possibly governments borrowing too much. So again, let's get into some of Buchanan's work and, and how this relates to this, this issue that we have at hand here. Okay. So one way to think about it is just from the perspective of uh, public choice economics, so mm -hmm. which Jim Buchanan is one of the co-founders of, of that school of thought. Uh, and you and I were lucky enough, actually, way back when you were in graduate school and when I was in graduate school, to actually be in seminars with Jim Buchanan mm -hmm. and, and, and talk to him. And it's, it's a really very simple way of looking at things. It's taking the economic approach of looking at you know rational individuals who are utility maximizing and taking that same logic of individual choice and it's not that people are always rational, it's just that they, they tend to move towards trying to improve their situations and applying that to the political arena. Mm -hmm. And when you bring debt into the picture, government debt, what you see is there are some incentive compatibility problems. Uh, what do I mean? I mean that when politicians make decisions about borrowing money, not only are they not the ones who necessarily have to pay it back, right, it's the mm -hmm. entire tax base who's eventually paying back government bonds and government debt, but also it's future generations. It's people who come later, and more than that, it's often long after they're out of office that the payments are still being made on a 30-year bond, for example. Mm -hmm. And so, and into this, uh, one of the significant results in public choice theory is something known as the, the median voter theorem, and the details of it aren't uh, relevant necessarily for what, we, what we're talking about today, but it does give us a way to make sense of this statement said that, that, that I offered earlier that maybe governments borrow too much. And so, how does the median voter allow us to, to make put a, a perspective on this? Right. Well, so there's a whole range of voter preferences, right? Among among a diverse population, right? There's a whole range of preferences. Mm -hmm. So there are there are people who would want to see the government borrow far more than they do, mm -hmm. and then there are people who would want the government to borrow nothing, kind of, you know, don't believe in government debt, Ex you know, in extreme fiscal conservatism. But the median voter probably is going to recognize that some level of government borrowing is efficient and have a preference to see some level of government borrowing. They don't necessarily want to burden themselves or future generations too much with debt, but they, they would accept some level of government debt. And so the median voter is just kind of that statistical middle. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the idea is if you're far beyond what the median voter would choose in terms of government debt, that suggests there's some sort of inefficiency with the way in which debt is taken on by the government. It's not something that's really in the control of the, the citizenry or the populace that votes. Mm 
So, so to be concrete about this, if for instance we were talking about the federal deficit and it's currently at about nineteen trillion dollars, right. but if the median voter, the average uh, voter out there, thought that well maybe we should be borrowing, but perhaps have ten trillion dollars in right. debt, not nineteen trillion dollars, that would be the basis on which we could then say it was like okay, well the the what we're observing isn't consistent with what the median voter really wants, right? That's right. right. You know, how is it that that would ever come about in a democracy? Because we do have this idea of governments of the people and by the people and for the people. So if, if government's supposed to be serving the interests of, of citizens and the, the, the median voter is going to be important in de determining what policies get de decided, how does this ever come about? Well, because spending is a is a particular type of, of, of game, right? And and so is mm -hmm. and so is government borrowing. These are not issues generally, especially at the federal level, that voters decide on one by one. Uh, the budget making is it's a complex process that involves many congressional committees and it involves the, the White House. And so what you see is there are lots of various constituencies who all want to see their budget priorities included, and because they all want their budget priorities included, the eventual passing of a budget requires a lot of compromise, and the compromise seems to always err on the side of including more of people's favorite mm -hmm. spending priorities rather than fewer. Mm -hmm. Another thing that uh, Professor Buchanan interjected into this whole argument is that uh, perhaps people have the, the average voter is going to have a hard time sort of thinking through what, what's actually going on with uh, borrowing, something that he uh, used the term fiscal illusion to discuss. Right. So what, what, what is, what's that and how is that of relevance here? So fiscal illusion just describes uh, a situation with government debt where voters are pretty keenly aware of their current level of taxation mm -hmm. and they're pretty keenly aware of the current level of government services that they can see and receive. What fiscal illusion does is it, it moves those two apart and, and, and it kind of, sep kind of separates the two. So bond payments that will be made over the next 30 years allow you to see a brand new capital project, a brand new government build building, a brand new hospital, a brand new school, a brand new bridge. They allow you to see uh, public goods that you can consume now, right now, uh, and the taxation has been deferred to, very, to the very distant future in many cases. Now, to the extent that we have fiscal illusion, these other issues, it's been suggested by Professor Buchanan in a, a, a book that he wrote with a, another of the uh, professors, George Mason, uh, Richard Wagner, that we're actually going to see a very systematic tendency for democracies to borrow way too much, right? Yes, uh, and and that's going to lead to some uh, some pretty unusual uh, solutions too at the federal level because the federal government has. You mentioned that there are state spending limits and state debt mm -hmm. limits. Uh, there are 49 states actually have a, uh, have a balanced budget requirement. The federal government doesn't really have such a thing. The federal government has an unusual ability not just to take on debt, but to monetize that debt. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? Well, if the federal government takes on more debt, it could always increase the money supply and thereby devalue the amount of debt it has. So that it, it still has to make debt payments in nominal terms. You know, It mm -hmm. still has to pay off $19 trillion in debt, but if they increase the money supply over time, that $19 trillion won't be worth in 20 years what it's worth today. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's part of the story that Buchanan and Wagner depicted, is that there are some perverse incentives, not just in terms of spending and taking on debt, but there are perverse incentives down the line in terms of future monetary policy. And in addition to the balanced budget rules that we have in place, uh, states also have rules in place limiting ba uh, borrowing by local governments as well. Yes. Right? They can uh, require things like referenda for passing bond issues, right? That's correct. Uh, it works differently in different states and mm -hmm. in different local, with different local governments, but either there is a set spending limit, or excuse me, a set debt limit, uh, so, for example, right now in Alabama, the current total debt limit for general obligation bonds is $750 million. Mm -hmm. And so that means if the state wanted to significantly increase its debt over that 750 then voters would have to actually pass a constitutional amendment, uh, a new constitutional amendment that would raise that debt limit. Mm -hmm. For local governments, it, also, it often goes case by case, but usually voter approval is required to increase general obligation debt. Mm 
Okay, so th that's another whole part, point of this uh, idea that we have constraints in place to try to limit the amount of, of borrowing. It's not just mm -hmm. a, a limit on the total amount, but there's a, uh, might have to get a referendum. So. Right. All right, so we've already sort of hinted at this, but there's more than one way to, to raise revenue if you're a state or, or local government. And, and this is where we need to try again to talk about some of these differences because they do end up being important, right? So mm -hmm. it turns out I think there are three cat main categories of, of different types of bonds that we might, the states or local governments might have. Uh, what are these three different categories? So I generally think of them as being general obligation bonds, mm -hmm. which are traditional government bonds, and I'll describe those a little bit. But also revenue bonds, traditional revenue bonds, and then a uh, fairly recent innovation, lease revenue bonds. Mm -hmm. General obligation bonds are state or local government issued bonds. Generally, these are the ones that require voter approval mm -hmm. because the payments on those bonds have to come from regular state or go local government appropriations. So these generally have very low interest rates. It's a, it's a very common debt instrument, and it's usually used for government capital projects. Mm -hmm. uh, quite often the, the buildings you see uh, in the capital or other state office buildings or sometimes schools or hospitals, that uh, sometimes these projects are used, uh, they use general obligation bonds and mm -hmm. voter approval is required. Revenue bonds uh, are generally not ones that require voter approval okay. because they're paid for by some revenue source. So for example, a toll bridge is the classic example, mm -hmm. right? Because a toll bridge generates revenue from people paying the tolls as they drive across it. And that revenue is then used to pay down the bond. So that's a classic example of a revenue bond. Uh, and sometimes hospitals are thrown in there because hospitals, even if they are state you know, run projects, they do generate some revenue. There's, you know, patients who pay, there's insurers who are making payments for treatment, and so mm -hmm. there's revenue generated, and that revenue can be used to pay down the bond. Now, to get into the, the, some of the, more of the differences there, the, a quote, revenue bond, is that going to affect like the, the budgeting process, like say that the, the state government is going to have to go through next year when they have to pass a, a, a budget? So in theory, no. In, in theory, uh, revenue bonds are going to be revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. Right, they're they're not going they're not going to require new appropriations because the project itself generates the revenue to pay the bond, uh, and ideally, in most cases, you would expect it to actually pay more in revenue. So it would pay more than enough. It would generate actually more revenue uh, for the state than would be required to make the bond payments. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea: is that it, at the at the worst in the worst case, they should be viewed as revenue neutral, but often they actually generate positive revenue. So they're not counted as state debt. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and so therefore, it's just the general obligation bonds that are, are come under all of these different uh, categories. So, if anything, we could refine our previous thinking about what was wrong with government debt, as saying it, what it almost seems to be more problematic is having too much debt that has to be serviced out of general tax revenue. That's right. right. That's right. And I mean, that's the thing about a general obligation bond is if the if the budget is already balanced, then some other spending needs to be cut or new tax revenue has to be generated in order to pay a general obligation bond. Mm -hmm. With a revenue bond, the idea is it's a project that generates revenue and that revenue itself will take care of the, the bond payments. And so no new tax revenue or spending cuts have to be made. And if you've got bonds uh, that are you know, in place for a long time, or as, as the bond borrowing bent builds up, I mean, you, you could get to a situation with these general obligation bonds, almost like we have with the federal government now, that we owe all these trillions of dollars in debt, and that you know, the interest payments turn out to be hundreds of, of billions of dollars every year. And yet, taxpayers today would have to be paying that, even though the spending occurred yesterday, right? Right. And so, the, the, for a variety of reasons, state governments, both in their legislatures, but also there, it's been kind of a populist movement among voters, that there was a there was a very significant push to force states to balance their budgets. Mm -hmm. They don't all balance it the same way. Some are allowed to carry over for three years or so. Uh, I think that's as high as it goes. And many states, Alabama is one of them, the requirement is it has any overage from the previous year has to be corrected in the current year budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
we set down the sort of the two traditional types of, of borrowing. And now we have this third type of borrowing that we mentioned at the beginning of the show, but we want to get into now, and that's this idea of a, a lease revenue bond. Mm -hmm. So what's different about this? So a lease revenue bond is, the, the idea is it's like a revenue bond, except the revenue is generated from a lease payment. However, the way it's been used is that the lease payment is also just from one government agency to another. Mm -hmm. So for example, in some other states, they've used lease revenue bonds to build uh, prisons, or in some cases, schools. So prisons and schools, for example, don't really generate revenue, right? Mm -hmm. public, public schools cost a lot of money. Prisons cost a lot of money. So what do they mean that there's revenue being generated? Well, what happens is the state, or sometimes a local government, creates a financial authority, a separate agency basically, of mm -hmm. the state or local government that issues the bonds, and then the school system or the Department of Corrections makes lease payments to that state agency, which then cover and create the revenue that is used to pay back the bond. Now, the revenue still ultimately, though, has to come from appropriations, which means some additional tax revenue or some spending cuts elsewhere are going to be required in order to make those payments. It's effectively moving right, yeah. the money from one pocket to another within the same state or local government. And sometimes it's intergovernmental. It will flow from the state to the local government or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it certainly sounds like, uh, just uh, on the surface as you describe it, it sounds like just a, a way to make an end run around uh, a, a re of the restriction on general obligation bonds because you're in effect saying that the this money coming out of the general fund or out of general taxes become quote the lease payments and then that, that those are the lease payments that are guaranteeing the bonds right right and that's uh, I mean so it really no new revenue is being created at all mm -hmm. but because it's considered a type of revenue bond voter approval is no longer required mm -hmm. now another thing that's involved with this, you mentioned this, uh, the idea of setting up uh, a, a government agency or independent agency or, or what are sometimes I think referred to as special purpose governments. Mm -hmm. And that's another whole part of the story, right? Yes. So tell us a little bit about some of these uh, special purpose governments. Well, uh, so the interesting idea here is, I, I love that one of the photos here is, is, is the DC Metro, right? So to, to create the metro system in Washington, D.C., I'm pretty sure it was bond funded, mm -hmm. right? It was, yeah. it was municipal bonds uh, within the District of Columbia, and they probably got counties in, Arling or in Virginia and Maryland to, to, to join in on that effort. So they do these bond issues, and then they create this metro authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and this metro authority is now, it's kind of a new branch of government that's providing a, you know, a, a unique service. It's, 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 it's running this particular system and it is generating revenue, but it's also receiving appropriations. Mm -hmm. So the, the, in effect, we were talking about some of the money coming from general uh, taxes. Mm -hmm. the, the taxes get appropriated or, or appropri to this special purpose government and then that's quote, revenue for the special purpose government? Or is, yes. Is sort of the way it gets yes, counted? they view that as part of their revenue. I mean, and that's, that's common with any, you know, state or uh, municipal or uh, county agency mm -hmm. is that they are going to view their appropriations as part of their revenue, right? Because it's a main source. It is a main source of their revenue. Mm -hmm. But what's, what we have to be careful about is understanding that this this is not some new revenue being generated. This is revenue that comes from ultimately taxpayers and appropriations. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of these special purpose governments across the country, right? Oh yes. I mean, every every state has several, some more than others. You know, I'm sure. And you know, in in very populous states uh, with very entrenched governments like New Jersey, there's a, there's more of this going on than there might be in you mm -hmm. know, say Nevada or even better Montana. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and there is sort of a hidden form of, of government. Now, what's been happening to uh, total state and local borrowing o o in recent history? So it's, dramatic, it's dramatically increased. Uh, yeah. One thing I've noticed in looking at Alabama and North Carolina is particularly since about 1980 or so, mm -hmm. uh, and you see that in this chart that's starting uh, 
starting around 1980, 1985, there's a dramatic increase. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should note just for the sake of, you know, not just transparency, but so people understand, there was not a huge, huge increase necessarily in 2004, but there was a change in how they measured, mm -hmm. change in the data source used uh, for this. But this, these data come from the, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and it's an attempt to measure all of the state and local government debt in the U.S. Uh, going all the way back to, to 1950. Uh, and this, it excludes pension. Uh, it excludes mm -hmm. pension obligations. So it really is, it's, it's, it's what you would think of in terms of state debt. It's, it's bond issues, but what's interesting about this series is that it also attempts to include a, the revenue bond mm -hmm. uh, data. And so certainly something's happened here to, to lead to much higher levels of, of, of state and local borrowing, even though, as we mentioned, 49 states ha have provisions in place limiting, the, uh, you know, in effect requiring some form of a balanced budget. So something's going on here, right? Right. Well, it's a way debt is, just like it is for you or I, it's the same for governments, debt is a way of increasing current spending, right, without proportionately increasing mm -hmm. how much revenue we need or how much income we need to cover it. So. Say one of our viewers, you know, a viewer might look at this and think like, okay, there seems to be uh, something going on here. Now, as economists, we'd probably want to uh, dig into this a little more, a little more deeply to try to see some kind of connection between uh, efforts to restrict borrowing by uh, state and local governments and uh, the, the these lease revenue bonds. And so, what what kind of data might we look at to? to get at this question? Well, ideally what you'd want to do to understand this a little better would be to look at a comparison between states with kind of hard, uh, stricter expenditure limits versus states without such strict expenditure limits. Mm -hmm. And see if the ones with stricter expenditure limits have resorted more to revenue bonds and lease revenue bonds to increase spending. Mm -hmm. And that's what this uh, study by another George Mason professor, uh, Jim Bennett, mm -hmm. uh, some years ago, uh, undertook, right? Yes. Uh, so Jim Bennett and Tom DiLorenzo looked at states with hard, uh, stricter expenditure limits versus states with less strict expenditure limits, and they did. They saw a much larger percentage increase, mm -hmm. uh, especially after 1972, uh, among the states that had these hard, uh, these kind of hard mm -hmm. constraints of expenditure limits. Is that those states were then spending less in the present, but they resorted more to debt to increase their spending. And, and so just to sort of make, help people see the way we'd be looking at this, the states that did and didn't in, uh, adopt a, a spending limit were, uh, had their local, their non-guaranteed local debt increasing at about the same rate in the years prior to the limits. That's right. And then you see this big difference in the, in the orange or the yellow there you know, for, uh, amongst the states that limited the right. local borrowing. The blue, the blue bars are very close to each other, mm -hmm. and those are the states that did not have, uh, that did not impose and did no. not have hard expenditure limits. Uh, and the orange reflects the ones that did. And so what you see is you do see a dramatic increase uh, among those states in, yeah. in terms of their state and local uh, debt. And that includes, it, the idea is it includes off the books debt. That's mm -hmm. what uh, DiLorenzo and, and Bennett were really looking mm -hmm. for. So people talk a lot about the, the concern of the federal government having uh, too much debt, but it seems like with growing a state and local government that we could be looking at a uh, local a state and local government debt problem in the uh, relatively near future in addition to the federal government it, it, debt problem. Is this a fair assessment, you think? I think that's a fair assessment. And the thing to really watch out for is how that debt can be serviced over time and how it can even be measured when so much of it is off books. Well, thanks very much for coming on and helping illuminate a complicated subject. And thank you for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations.